said I'm walking in victory. Walking in victory. Get my joy back. Oh, I'm walking in victory. Said I'm walking in victory. I'm walking in victory. Grace is 
Hey, New Zion. Just want y'all to know that I miss y'all. I hope you and your families are doing well. Uh, I understand that we're socially distancing right now. We're unable to meet here together at church, but there's a lot of different ways that you can stay connected with us. You can get on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Realm. We even have a website. It's NewZionRockford.com. And if you're really feeling like you, you know, froggy, you can catch us on the phone, 815-964-3114. Have a good day.
Good morning. My name is Kay Edward Copeland, and I want to welcome you to another online worship experience right here at New Zion Baptist Church in Rockford, Illinois. We're preaching through the book of Colossians, and today we're at Colossians chapter 3, verses 18, all the way up through chapter 4, verse 1. After you hear the reading of the scripture, we're going to give ourselves to the text. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask you to get your Bible or whatever apparatus you use to access the scripture and do us a favor. Go ahead and like this video or share it with somebody. Start a watch party so that we can get this gospel message out. Listen now to the reading of the scripture from Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, up through chapter 4, verse 1. Hello, Nazian. I'll be reading Colossians 3, 18 to 25, as well as chapter 4, verse 1 from the New American Standard Bible. You can follow along in whichever translation you have. It reads as follows. Wives, be subject to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he does, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. The grass withers, the flower soon fades away, but the word of our God will stand forever. Today from this passage of scripture, we wanna talk about getting my house in order. It's very interesting that here in the United States of America, we have a fascination with family. When you think about all of the fictional families we've grown up with, it's astounding. Depending upon your generation, you might have grown up with the Dick Van Dyke show. You might have grown up with Petticoat Junction or Green Acres or another generation has grown up with All in the Family, with Good Times, with the Jeffersons. Uh, might have grown up with the Huxtables or with the Parker family or with the Banks family on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air or even now there's a generation growing up with the family on the show, This Is Us. We've all grown up with fictional families, but the truth of the matter is that the fantasy that we see on TV as families are depicted, or even as workplace situations are depicted, are very often different from what we experience at home. And maybe that's been the draw, the pull, the, the magic of TV families. We can escape from our existential reality and play out our fantasies through the families we see on TV. Problem with it is those were just fantasies. The Huxtables weren't really the Huxtables. Bill Cosby is in jail as we speak. The Banks family on the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, if you paid attention, there's a special on right now, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air reunion where just now, some behind the scenes things that had caused tremendous pain over the last 20 or so years are just now being resolved. Truth of the matter is, we live in a broken world with broken families. And very often, we don't know how to work things out in our family situation. And now with COVID-19, we're quarantined in. And so even though crime in general has gone down, domestic violence has skyrocketed because our houses are not in order. And not just our houses, even the work situation. When we consider the lack of income because of the lack of a, and the lack of a stimulus package, or the fact that this pandemic has disrupted our whole work situation, not just for those who have to work from home, but those who have lost their jobs because of the pandemic, 
we really need some help right now. And praise be to God, we're at this section of the scripture in Colossians where Paul is going to show us that the resurrected life, that is our life in Christ, actually has an impact on our imper imperfect families. And that through the gospel of Christ, we can move our families from where they are to towards where we would want them to be. There's no such thing as a perfect family, but we do have a perfect father and he is willing to perfect us as we live this resurrected life and as we let the word of Christ dwell in us richly so that we can learn how to in everything let Jesus Christ have the priority. That's primarily the argument in here in the book of Colossians. And so we're going to take a look at three sets of relationships in these verses, the relationship between husband and wife, relationship between parent and child, and the relationship between those who serve and those who supervise. I need to lay out a few um, provisos at first, a few things that we need to get straight before we dive into this particular scripture today. And I want you to pay attention. Number one, what we're going to look at is we're trying to move toward the model home, what a home should look like. But you cannot disconnect what we're going to describe from verses 18 all the way through chapter 4, verse 1. You cannot disconnect that from chapter 3, verse 17, which says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is to say, it is only through a relationship with him, a connection with him, that these things can be accomplished. It's in his name, in his authority, through his power, that these structures, our, our marriage structure, our parental structure, and even our work structure, it's only through him that these things can be transformed as we're willing to submit to his way and to his will. That's number one. We're looking at a, a model situation, a model home. Number two, they had different social structures in this time and in this part of the country and so we can't make one-on-one -on -one comparisons completely. We have to latch on to the timeless principles. So for example, in this text, it's gonna talk about slaves and masters. And I don't want you to get hung up on that because in their social structure, they did have slaves and masters. It was not like American chattel slavery because in that culture and in that time, uh, slaves could not be inherited and uh, slavery was not based up, up on skin color and slavery did not have this this white supremacist uh, philosophy underpinning it where people's value was color coded back in biblical times in Old Testament as well as the New Testament. If a particular country was captured, then they made slaves out of those people, but it wasn't based upon your ethnicity or this whole idea of color is a, a recent innovation to try to uh, make a caste system solidified and easily put into place. So don't get caught up in that. We, we recognize that the scripture we're reading, they had a different structure, even as it relates to how women were treated and the fact in this structure back in the Old Testament, uh, New Testament times, the servants, were actually counted as part of the household. So recognize that we're gonna be just latching on to the timeless principles that underpin these scriptures and we're going to see how the gospel transforms even structures, even their structure of slavery was transformed. And we'll see that clearly. Let me just show my hand. There's a man named Onesimus who was one of Paul's partners who was a slave. And there's a whole book of the Bible called Philemon where Paul, argues to the former master because this slave Onesimus has run away and Paul argues to that master that in the gospel he's not your slave he's your brother in Christ so just recognize that when we come to some of these uh, difficult uh, sort of situations in the scripture that they were in a different time in a different place but we can still get the timeless principles from them and apply them to our time and our place. And even within this different time and place, God was transforming the structure, how women were treated, how children were treated, and yes, even how slaves were treated. 
back in those days. Another thing I want to point out is that as we work through this, Paul is going to pick out the natural flashpoints for each of these relationships and address them like a master di uh, di uh, with a master diagnosis. So when we get to husband and wife, uh, Paul is going to point out, okay, I'm going to give you some prescriptions because I know where the natural flashpoints are. But having said that, let me say this. I don't want anything that I say today as we work through this idea of getting our houses in order to suggest in any way that if you're single, that these scriptures don't apply to you. If you're single, you need to pay attention because I need you to understand that singleness is not a lesser status in the kingdom. It's not second-class citizenship. Just because we're talking about marriage doesn't mean that you don't need to listen, number one. And it doesn't mean that somehow or another that marriage is, in God's sight, somehow or another better than singleness. Whatever state we're in, we need to find a way to serve the Lord. And as a matter of fact, Paul in 1 Corinthians makes the argument that if you can stay single, then stay single. So just recognize that even though the emphasis today might seem to emphasize marriage, single people, you still need to listen to this sermon. Why? Because someday you might want to get married and you need to know what it's supposed to look like. And then secondly, you need to be able to pray for your married friends and family as they try to perfect their relationships. Final thing I want to say before we get into the text is that we live in a broken world. And some of the things I'm going to describe are the ideal that we're looking toward. We'll unpack what reality looks like and how to move toward the ideal, but I need you to understand that we're trying to show you what God intends for our lives as we live this resurrection life. If nobody ever shows you the cover of a jigsaw puzzle, it's hard for you to put the pieces together. So we wanna show you the picture, and then we wanna at least start giving you some of the edges so you can work out how each piece fits together in your life. So having said that, let's take a look at this piece. He gives us three sets of relationships. So let's look at the first one. In verses 18 and 19, he's going to talk about marriage. Type in marriage. If you're paying attention, I want you to be interactive with me today. Type in marriage. You might be single. You might be married. You might be divorced. You might be widowed. But you need to latch onto this and pay attention so you'll know what God intends as well as how we can work from where we are to where we would like to be. It starts off by saying, and again, remember, this is all following verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus with an attitude of gratitude. Then he starts in at the house. Here's how we can get our houses in order. Number one, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. This idea of submission is a dirty word in a lot of arenas because texts like these have been taken out of context and have been used uh, to use to mistreat wives and, and use to justify a whole lot of craziness. But what Paul is getting at here is a very simple idea. It's a military term where he says wives be subject. It literally means to line up under in rank, just like in the armed services, whether you talk about the army, Navy, Marines, whatever service uh, there is, they have ranks, generals, uh, colonels, lieutenants, sergeants. I don't know all of the ranks, but I do know this, that your rank doesn't mean that intrinsically as a person, you're better than someone. It just means you got a different role. And if this army, if this Navy, if the, this Marine Corps is going to function right, everybody got to line up according to rank. And so this text where it says, wise, be subject to your husband, is basically an idea of the wife voluntarily aligning herself with the position that God has given the husband. God is holding the husband responsible. God is holding the husband accountable. And this says to the wives, in Christ, you need to learn how to align yourself with your husband. That doesn't mean you're a second-class citizen. That doesn't mean that he makes all the decisions, but that means the buck stops with him from the Lord's perspective 
and you need to line up under. You need to follow his leadership as is fitting in the Lord. Notice, we're going to see in all of these situations, the reference point is to the Lord. It's not that you're lining up, voluntarily lining up uh, behind your husband because he's better than you, because he's smarter than you, or because he's more mature than you. It's because you're lining up as unto the Lord, because it's fitting in the Lord. In this resurrected life, the idea is that wives has a, have a responsibility to line up so that the house stays in order. But wait a minute, watch this. Husbands are to love their wives and not be bitter toward them or not be harsh toward them. In other words, the wife's responsibility in the natural flashpoint, the natural um, place where there would be possible misalignment is this idea of submission. But with the husband, it's learning how to be tender in your attitude toward your wife. Love your wife. Now, in the book of Ephesians, Paul makes the same argument and he goes much more extensively talking about how a husband is supposed to love his wife. But sufficient for our take today is this idea is that the husband's primary responsibility is to serve his wife's highest good. That's what love, agape love means. There are several different words in the Greek for love. Eros, love means romantic love. And that's not what it's talking about. It's not just about chemistry. Philia is partnership love, friendship love. You're supposed to be friends, but it's more than that. Storge is family love. It's more than you treat her as if she was your blood relative. It's agape love. It's the type of love that God has for us. It's self-sacrificing love where the highest good of the other, of, of the beloved, is your highest priority. And it says to husbands, you need to make your wife your priority and you need to do it, wait a minute, with the right attitude. Don't be bitter or literally harsh. Don't be hard toward them because there's a tendency for husbands to get hard hearted. And Paul addresses this piece. So for husbands and wives, if we're gonna live this resurrected life, the wife needs to learn how to align herself. The husband needs to learn how to adjust his attitude so that his attitude is tender toward his wife and he's loving her like Christ loves the church. Look what he says about children and parents in verses 20 and 21. It says, children be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Notice again that the reference point is to the Lord. So children need to learn how to listen and be obedient, in their, obedient to their parents in all things. Now, obviously, because he says this is well-pleasing to the Lord, that means that if your parents are trying to get you to do something that would not please the Lord, if they're trying to get you to do something illegal, unethical, immoral, obviously you wouldn't do that because that would not please the Lord. But it also is suggesting to those who are children that you need to obey your parents. You need to listen to what your parents have to say. It doesn't matter. Let me say this. It doesn't matter that you got the college degree and you think you're smarter than your parents. Your parents have already been where you're trying to go. And they've already forgotten what you're trying to know. So you need to learn how to listen to your parents, but parents need to learn how to lead their children in a way that will help them to not lose motivation. Look what it says in verse 21, specifically to fathers. Now, the 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 way the, uh, the word that is used there could suggest parents. And in point of fact, I do want to point out to single parents, this applies to you as well. But the emphasis is on the father because fathers in particular have, if they're not careful, can exasperate their children. This word where it says fathers do not exasperate your children so they will not lose heart. It's this idea of leave them in a way that they don't feel so overtaxed because you're unpleasable. They don't feel so overburdened because you, from your perspective, they don't ever do anything right. They, they don't feel, they don't lose heart. This, this idea of just being disheartened. The parents, particularly fathers, have a responsibility to lead in such a way that your family, your children are motivated to do what needs to be done. Then look at this third set in verses 22 through chapter four, verse one. He talks about, first of all, Slaves and all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service or in other words, with eye service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart 
fearing the Lord. And whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than from men. In other words, he's talking to, and again, we pointed out that in that culture, slave, they did have slaves and they did have masters. That was the cultural convention of their day. We don't have legal slavery now. We have employers and employees. So for those who serve, this is getting at sort of a theology of work. And I, I want to say this just as a side note, that all work is sacred from God's perspective. It's, it's not just the preacher. It's not just the deacon. Whatever you do, God has given you a vocation. He's given you skills. He's given you talents, abilities, and he's given you a place to employ those things so that you can take care of your family, take care of yourself. All work has dignity and all work should be done as unto the Lord. It was Martin Luther King in one of his last uh, speeches talked about the fact that if it's your lot to sweep streets, then you ought to sweep streets like Michael An Michelangelo painted, painted paintings. That you ought to sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. You ought to sweep streets in such a way that even the angels themselves peer down from glory and say, there goes a great sweet street sweeper. The idea is that all work has dignity. And if you have a job, you need to do your job with energy, not just when people are watching you, but as if, and this is the case, as if God is watching you because God is ultimately the one you want to please. Because if you look at the rest of the verses, verse 24 and 25, he says something very interesting. Even if you are not getting what you're supposed to get from the place where you're working now, just recognize God is keeping records too, and he keep better records than your job keeps, and he will reward you if you're working as unto the Lord. And look at, look at the converse. If you're being mistreated on your job, even if, that's what verse 24 says, for he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. So that's a double-edged sword. So if you're not doing your job, if you're cheating on work, cheating on your job, then God is watching that too. But watch this, if you're being cheated, that is to say, if you're not being treated as you ought to be treated, just recognize your supervisor got a supervisor and your HR department ain't the final word. If you can't get justice and fairness on pavement level, you got an alternative route to get upstairs and make sure that everything gets straightened out. Look at this last thing, and then we're going to come back through this and see how we work all this out. Look at verse one of chapter four. He said, now masters, and I want you to think of supervisors. If you're a supervisor on your job or an employer, masters grant your slaves or your servants justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Literally what he's saying is if the employee needs to work with the energy that God provides as if God is watching them, then the employer needs to supervise with equity, knowing that you got a box. You need to do things with justice and fairness without partiality, because just recognize while you're strutting around talking about you, the supervisor, you got a supervisor and he ain't on payroll. He's watching everything. Well, that's how it lays out. But now let's admit that it's hard to do all of this for a few different reasons. So now let's go back through this and see how do, if this is the ideal, how it's supposed to work, how can I get from what the Bible prescribes as the idea, ideal or describes as the ideal to from where I am to that ideal? That is to say, how can I start working this out practically? Let's go on back through it right quick. Now, the truth of the matter is it says, wives be subject to your husbands as it's fitting in the Lord. Well, truth of the matter is it is possible as a wife to be married to a fool. Don't look at him right now. I'm just making a theological point. If you read your scripture, you'll find back in the Old Testament, a woman named Abigail, who was married to a man named Nabal. Nabal, N-A-B-A-L, means fool. She was literally married to a fool. But watch how this works out. I'm, I'm trying to show you that this can actually be worked out through the power of the Lord. If you want to live a resurrection life, you can put this into practice and you can try this at home. Abigail was married to a fool. Uh, David and his boys, David and his crew, 
uh, David had goons. Now, you, you know that from the Old Testament, David wasn't no joke. And he, the fellas he had with him weren't no joke either. And while he was on the run from Saul, David happened to come upon Nabal. He had a whole lot of sheep. He was a, uh, a sheep herder, uh, a sheep farmer. He had a tremendous num number of sheep. And it came time that when David was uh, uh, wandering away, wandering in the wilderness and tr escaping from Saul and all these types of things while he was on the run, he would protect Nabal's sheep. That is to say, while David was moving from place to place, while he was out there in the wilderness, just as a matter of courtesy, he and his boys would make sure that nobody would mess with the shepherds that were taking care of Nabal's sheep. Why? Because David was a shepherd. He knew how dangerous being a shepherd was if you out there by yourself. And so he just provided security, even though he didn't have to, because he, he recognized, man, I remember what it was like working the night shift as a shepherd, so I'm going to take care of these fellas. So he did that. What happened was when it became sheep shearing time, it was time to shear the sheep, David and his fellas were hungry, and he sent word to Nabal. He said, look here, we out here in the wilderness, we uh, been sort of taking care of your fellas while they wash the sheep. If you got some food on him, please send it out our way because we're hungry. Nabal, because he, he was a fool, Nabal sent word back to David, so who are you? I ain't sending you nothing. You ain't nobody. David got word. He said, man, this is a fool for real. I'm out here protecting your sheep for free, and all I ask is for a few sandwiches. You don't act like you brand new. He told his fellas, hey, everybody strap up. We fixing to go ride. Nate, Nabal's wife, Abigail, I'm talking about, here's how this works out. She's married to a fool, but Abigail, when she heard what was going on, she was subject to her husband as is fitting to the Lord. But watch what she did. She got word that David was coming. She packed up all the food that she could find at the house and went out to meet David. She bowed down and said, look, you know what? Uh, it, it's my fault. I wasn't at the house when uh, the message came. Uh, I know that you and your boys are hungry. Look, I bought some food. L listen, my, my husband is a fool. So just please don't. Don't hurt him. Uh, just receive this at my hand and please forgive him. David said, because you so wise and because you such a good wife, I'm not going to harm your husband. So he went on about his business. Abigail went back home and uh, she didn't tell her husband at first, but the next day when he heard the story that literally there was a goon squad coming to kill him and the only thing that saved him was he had a submissive wife, a wife that had wisdom, was willing to cover up his mistakes and that was willing to go and intercede on his behalf before the king. Because he had that, he was spared. Now, <laughs> the way the story winds up, once he heard that David was coming to get him and that his wife had diverted him, diverted David, he basically had a stroke, fell down dead, and Abigail married David. Don't try that at home. But my point is simply this. If a wife who's married to a fool will intercede on behalf of that fool before the king, God will make everything turn out all right. So give me a heart and like on that. I'm preaching today. But wait a minute. What about husbands? The text says, husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. What if you got a wife that is just out of order? Well, your wife ain't more out of order than Hosea's wife. There's a whole book of the Bible about how a husband can love his wife, even if she's out of order. Hosea married a woman named Gomer. Gomer was a prostitute and she couldn't stay out the streets. She bringing in babies that didn't belong to him and fooled around, got caught up to where she was sold into slavery. I remember I told you that back in those days, slavery wasn't based on race. It wasn't based on ethnicity, it was either based upon the fact that a country got captured and then they were taken into slavery, or if you owed a debt, if you couldn't pay off your debt, then you had to pay off the debt by going into indentured servitude. And even then it wasn't perpetual, but Gomer was on the auction block and Hosea with tender love went and bought her back. So don't tell me you can't love your wife because the truth of the matter is we got biblical record that this does work, that you, you can love your wife with the love of the Lord and bring her out of her waywardness. You can help her, you can love her back into order.
What about children? Well, children, be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing to the Lord. Do we have a biblical record of that? What about Jesus? Jesus, now think about this. Jesus, the very Lord of creation, the Bible says very specifically in, uh, in the book of Luke, as well, I believe in the book of Matthew, that Jesus obeyed his parents in all things. Jesus, even though he did know more than his parents, Jesus created everything. He obeyed his parents. He submitted himself to his parents. And even to the point that uh, when his father apparently was no longer available, even on the cross, Jesus looked out for his mother. He told John, he said, look, John, behold your mother. He told his mother, behold your son. He was looking out for his mother. Jesus was obedient and you can be obedient too, even if your parents are not all that they could or that they should be. What about fathers and children? You ever heard of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15? This man had a son, had two sons actually, and the younger one of them came to him and said, I want my inheritance now. Literally, what he was saying is, I wish you were dead. I want my inheritance now. The father was so gracious, he let him have his way. Now he was grown, he let him have his way. The boy wound up in a pig pen of a situation. When he finally came to his senses, he said, why am I sitting here in a pig pen and my daddy got a palace? But here's the point. The father in that story was not only generous in allowing his son to make his own choices and suffer the consequences of those choices, the father was so loving that the Bible says when the father saw this young man a long way off, which means he had to be looking for him, he ran toward him. And even the boy, though the boy was smelling like pigs, he hugged him. He kissed his neck. He brought out his best robe. He brought out his best sandals, brought out his ring and restored him to status. In other words, I want to say something to the fathers. Even if you have grown children who have decided that they want to live piggish, you need, to let, you need to love them enough to let them make choices and suffer the consequences of their choices, but always leave the light on and leave the door open. Because you never know when they might come to them, their senses and recognize, I'm not a pig, so I don't need to be in this pig pen. I'm going to go on back to my daddy's house. You need to leave the door open. You, you see my point, do you not? That all of these things can be done in the Lord. Let me give you a, one other piece. What about an employee? What, what if you got a bad work situation? Come here, Joseph. Let's see if I can get you to testify. Joseph had a bad family situation and a bad work situation. His brothers sold him into slavery out of jealousy. But here, here's my point. Joseph, while he was a slave, he worked so hard. He did his job so well, even though his family had done him wrong and sold him into a foreign situation, Joseph started doing his work and he did his work so well that the master, Potiphar, the, the owner of the house of man, he put him over everything to such an extent that Joseph controlled the whole house except what the master ate. Food around because he was fine in form and face, food around and caught a case uh, there in an episode of Real Housewives of Egypt, uh, got accused of sexual harassment. He didn't do it, but hey, got a case. And while he was in jail, here's my point. While he was in jail, he still worked. He worked so well that the jailer said, man, Joe, you in charge of everything. And guess what? Because he did things so well in jail, he wound up in the palace and he he wound up being second in charge, the prime minister of the country of Egypt. And if you read the story, uh, Pharaoh made an edict saying, better not nobody raise their hand or lift their foot without your say so, because you running this whole piece. Now, here's my point. If you work, if you do your work as unto the Lord, God will promote you. Doesn't matter how bad the situation, doesn't matter how grimy the job is. It, Joseph started out in a slave pit. He started out in slavery, wound up in jail, wound up in the penitentiary. So from the pit to the penitentiary, but the way he got to the palace was he, he kept on working wherever he was, did his job the best way he knew how to do it. So 
Like, what's the upshot of all of this thing? I don't want to keep you all day. I'm trying to share with you the way you can get your house in order. And so let me give you uh, three little things that this text teaches us when we step back for a moment. And then let me end with how ultimately this can work. Number one, each one of us, according to this text and what we've seen here, each one of us has an independent responsibility to do what we're called to do in our families and in our work situations. Wives have to be subject to their husbands, even if you're married to a fool. Now, here it again, here it is again. If you're single and you can stay single, stay single, and then your life will be less complicated. And if you're single, I want you to understand what the roles are so you don't marry a fool. But if you're married and your husband is acting a fool, you still have an independent responsibility to the Lord to seek his face and to try to work that out. That doesn't mean that you stay in an abusive situation. That doesn't mean that you allow yourself to be a doormat, but it does mean that you stop making excuses for not lining up behind the one who you made a commitment to. Husbands are independently responsible to the Lord to love their wives regardless of how she's acting. You chose her, you gave her the ring, now work it out. If uh, Will and Jada can work out their entanglements. If Cardi B and Offset can figure out how to get back together, you need to stay on in there and work that thing out with your wife. Children and parents, you, you get the idea. We're independently responsible. So children, you are independently responsible to the Lord for doing what's right by your parents and parents vice versa. You get the idea. It's about our independent responsibility, but not only that, our interdependent relationship. I mean, listen carefully. My obedience makes your obedience easier. If a husband loves his wife, then it's easier for her to submit. If uh, parents don't exasperate their children, it's easier for them to obey. If employers treat their employees with justice and fairness, with equity, then it's easy to want to come to work and to do your work with all of your heart. So even though we're independently responsible to God, we have to recognize that we're interdependent with one another. And if I do what's right, it helps other people do what's right. And very often, some of the reasons that it's hard for others to do what's right is because they're waiting on me. So we have an independent responsibility, number one, but we have interdependent relationships with one another. What I do affects you, what you do affects me, and one of us, listen, can't be two fools at a time. One of us needs to be the Christian in the situation, and then it makes it easier for others to get in line in the household. But then number three, all of this is dependent upon the resurrection reality that our Lord and Jesus Christ gives us strength. If you'll notice throughout this whole text, it's, it keeps saying that you do this because it's fitting to the Lord. You do this out of fear for the Lord. You do this because you get your reward from the Lord. It's the resurrected Christ. See, our, horiz our horizontal relationships will only work right when we get our focus on the vertical. That is, if we keep our focus on him, then it helps us to work out all these other things. And then the wife will recognize, okay, when I submit to my husband, it's counted as credit as unto the Lord. When the husband recognizes, when I love my wife, regardless of how she responds, it's counted as credit as unto the Lord, so on and so forth. So the idea is that we're dependent upon his strength in order to help us to do this. Why? How is it that we can depend on his strength? Because everything that he's asking us to do, he's already done it. Wife, when he tells you to submit, he submitted to such an extent, listen carefully, he took on the form of a servant, became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He submitted completely to his father. Father, into your hands, I, I submit, I commit my spirit. He submitted even to the point of giving his life. You want to talk about love? He loved us so much, husband. He loved us so much that he gave his life. And the idea is that husbands only have the responsibility to love their wives like Christ loves the church. How much did he love the church? Even while we were yet sinners, he demonstrated his love toward us by giving his life. Uh, the issue of obedience to his father, the issue of uh, a father loving his children, all of that is epitomized 
in Christ. He obeyed his father to the extent of going to the cross. He loves us so much uh, as his children. He's called the everlasting father to such an extent that even if father and mother forsake us, Psalm 27, verse 10, the Lord will lift us up. He worked for us. Listen carefully. He worked for us so hard on Calvary that now we can rest. His work, his completed work on Calvary is what allows us to rest in our salvation. On Calvary, when he said it is finished, what that meant is all the work that was needed in order to make us right with God, he had completed. Now it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. He put in the work. Now we can rest. Now he tells us, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, uh, for you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy, my burden is light, and you'll find rest for your souls. You, you understand how this works? In other words, there's nothing that God asks us to do that he has not already done for us. That's our motivation. That's our inspiration. That's how we can... Uh, that's how we can do what seems to be impossible in our families as well as our work situations because we have the model of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's never going to ask us to do anything that he hasn't already done. And so I want to challenge you in your household as well as in your work situation to learn how to lean in on him, to learn how to independently be responsible to do what you've been called to do, recognizing that we're in interdependent relationships and that when I do what I'm supposed to do, it makes it helps to get the whole house or the whole office in order. But I'm doing it because one loved me so much that he gave his life. He submitted, he obeyed, he listened to his father. And now he's the master that one day I expect to get my pay from. And guess what? Payday's coming and it's coming very soon. Just read the paper and read your Bible. You know he's on his way back. And when he comes back, he's bringing his reward with him. And all of those who love his appearing will receive their just reward from this righteous judge. So if you're listening to this today and you've never opened up your heart to receive the love of Jesus Christ, all of this family talk needs to be rooted in this resurrection reality. He died for your sins and mine, but he was raised on the third day for our justification. Now, if you'll put your trust in him, he'll help you to live this resurrection type of life. When I say resurrection type of life, I mean that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to us to help us to love our partners, to help us to live in harmony with our family, to help us to labor on our job with the energy that he provides. If you've never prayed to receive him, today is the day, now is the time. Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Secondly, if you're already a Christian, but you don't have a church home, we're not a perfect church. I'm not a perfect pastor. We don't have any perfect people here. But the Lord is perfecting us by his love, and we might be perfect for you. So if you want more information about church membership, just reach out in the comments section or go to our website and join our mailing list. Or you can call the church at 815 964 3114. Finally, you're already a Christian. You're already active in some church or another. I want you to make a commitment during this holiday season to do all you can to get your house in order. I'm not talking about cleaning up. I'm not talking about decluttering. You can do that, but I'm talking about the love relationship that you have with the people that you live with, as well as the working relationship you have with the people that you labor with. I'm asking you to be the one who takes responsibility to do what you've been called to do and watch God work on your behalf. It's a very stressful time in our country, very stressful time in our homes, in our workplaces, but God can use you to be a blessing to all the people around you. And I pray that he does that, even during the middle of this pandemic. Let me pray for you and as we let you go today. Great God, our Father, thank you for opening your word to us today. Thank you for opening our eyes. Now, we pray that you would help us to not just be hearers, but doers of your word. Help us to get our individual hearts in order so we can get our houses in order. We pray, dear God, that you would help us to submit to you, first and foremost, to obey you, 
first and foremost, to work as unto you in everything that we do. And we're asking you to take care of all the rest. So I pray, Father, for every household that watches this, wherever they, whatever's lacking, missing, or broken, that you would make up the difference. I pray, dear God, where there's confusion, you would bring clarity. I pray, dear God, that where there's been tension, that you would bring peace. Not just the absence of tension, but the actual harmonious working together of a loving family. I pray that you would do this in such a way that all will have to see that only you could have done it. So you'll get the glory and we'll get the benefit. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening today. We pray that you are blessed by this word. And we look forward to uh, seeing you real soon uh, back here online on Facebook. Or you can catch us on YouTube. You can catch us ultimately every day on our 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. prayer line. And we'll put the information up for that. And in all things, we pray that you would keep your trust in the Lord because the resurrected Christ will help us to get our houses in order. God bless you and have a great day.